Hello, welcome to Not the BBC. The following is a conversation with Tom Luongo. Tom is a geopolitical analyst and he's the host of the Gold Goats and Guns podcast. Now, I wanted to have Tom on because he's been one of the few people who's been able to really break down what's going on from a geopolitical level. You know, a lot of us have this sort of caricature sense of a monolith in Davos that's been behind a lot of the events of the last couple of years. But Tom's actually been able to break this down into factions and actually give us a much more high resolution picture for what's going on. And what's particularly of interest and why I was kind of keen to get him on now is that he's been able to actually flesh out some of the disagreements that have been going on. You know, there are visible cracks emerging amongst the global elite. And Tom has been able to sort of give us a sense for why this is happening. And specifically, he he's keen to distinguish between what's going on in the US and the Federal Reserve and the commercial banking interests and what's going on in Europe with Davos and people like Christine Lagarde. And he really sees a, a fracturing that's gone on there. And so I wanted to get him on to flesh that out and to give us a sense for what, you know, where it might go next and, and what the sorts of pieces of evidence that he has. I was also keen to dig into, well, where does this leave the U- UK? What, how do we make sense of our power? Are we, you know, are we sort of some satellite of both of them or can he give us a bit more of, a, of an understanding of that? So that was the nature of the conversation. I, I really enjoyed it. Tom's also just, you know, very, very funny guy and, and very entertaining to listen to. So no doubt you'll enjoy this one. I certainly did. Tom, welcome to Not The BBC. Oh, good morning, Seb. How are you? It's all good afternoon, I guess, for you because you're just five, about, five yeah, hours well, behind me. So yeah, so good to meet you. Um, thanks for the invite. No, not at all. I've been I've been looking forward to this. As I was saying to you beforehand, I've sort of, the amount of your content that I've been kind of tuning into has been steadily increasing. Um, because for a long time, you've been one of the few people who's been able to kind of create a non caricature, build a non caricatural picture of what's going on, right? And kind mm-hmm. of actually be able to speak to the sort of macro severity of what's going on, but also get more specific as to you know what's actually going on in the markets and. Mm-hmm. Who are the you know who are the actual real movers and shakers and, and the rest of it? So um, definitely always been worth paying attention to. But you know more recently, I think some of the some of the things you've been coming out with recently, talking about the sort of potential breakdowns and conflicts within elites, I've found extremely yeah. interesting. So so we'll get to that. But um, but yeah, definitely someone that I think is worth paying attention to. So I'm I'm really excited to be speaking to you. Um, so to in terms of starting off we'll get into some more specifics later, but I think it's useful by way of introduction, perhaps for you to sort of explain a little bit about kind of where you're coming from and what you see up and let's say up until the start of COVID, what you kind of see the big geopolitical picture to be and what kind of state and what, how you ascribe the malaise of, of the West. I think it would be interesting to kind of get a bit of a framework. Well, right? yeah. So, so I, I, I'm a libertarian and Austrian economist. So we've always, you know, from that perspective, I always looked at the world from that perspective. So I always knew that the um, we were headed for, you know, kind of Misesian crack up boom. And I always and the big question for all of us in this, in this NAC community for years has been which one of the booms is going to be? Was it, you know, the one post 2008? Was it this one? You know, you know what's the what boomlet was going to finally be the one, right? Well, and we've all been wrong. I've been wrong. Peter Schiff's been wrong. Like every, all of us have been wrong because we all called the crack a boom back in 2008. Mm. No. Um, over time, you know, you're, you know, as you assess the world and as you get more information, as you look more deeply into various things and factions and bring other people into your picture. So you, you focus on the conflict between say Russia and the United States, but then you have to start looking at Turkey. Then you have to start looking at Syria. Then you have to start looking at Ukraine and, you know, and so as you build that map, right? That big mental map of what the factions look like and what's going on. You're also filling back in history that you missed mm. along the way. I mean, we all do this. This is nothing. I'm as guilty of this as anybody else in my life. I, I didn't know nine tenths of what I think I t- know today mm. about geopolitics yet just five years ago. Mm. Okay. Cause it's a constant, un- it's a constant battle to improve your perspective. So when you come into COVID, right? The big issue was very simply Davos, which I kind of coined the term the Davos crowd. I actually I know I coined the term Davos crowd back in 2017 on a lark. I'm like, I needed a way to shorthand to talk about these people. Hmm. Um create, you know, they were apoplectic about both Brexit 
and the election of Donald Trump, because it was the first time that they were derailed from their, uh, from their plan towards the, uh, which was originally agenda 2050 and now has been accelerated to agenda 2030. And that Davos spanned both sides of the Atlantic. You had the elites in the United States along in the banking sector and, 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 and all the elites, all the giants. I'm going to use that, um, that metaphor today because I was thinking about this the other day and I think this is a very good metaphor. We ants are trying to figure out what the giants are doing, right? Mm. Um, it's like, you know, thunder is the gods fighting, right? Um, kind of thing. So back then, everybody was on the same page. But here's the thing. When people start to lose, right? When, every, when you're all winning, I like guess in the hockey metaphor, when you're all winning, nothing, um, uh, nothing cures problems in the room like winning, they say yeah. in hockey, right? In the, in, the, the, in the dressing room. Same thing in the locker room Football, in the NFL yeah, or baseball yeah. or anywhere else. Yeah, yeah. In, as a, using a sports metaphor, nothing solves problems like winning. Well, what yeah. happens when you start losing? That's when just, the problems start to... Just quickly, to, in terms of the, the winning streak... Right. Let's say the all the way up until all the way up until Brexit, Trump, really all the way up until Putin took Crimea in 2014. Yeah. Starting from I, end of the Second World War, or how? Yeah, kind of. Well, yeah, just like yeah, from the uh, from the uh, the, the post World War II architecture all yeah. the way up until then, um, everything has kind of mostly gone to plan. Yeah, and then we get into 2013 uh, when David or 20. 12 late 2012 when david cameron loses a, a vote in parliament saying no you're not going to go along with barack obama to invade syria mm. that was that's what actually brought uh, started the process of bringing cameron down that's the first thing that happened after that that opened the way for um putin uh, to putin to settle a um settle the, the conflict that obama had picked over the chemical weapons attack in syria brokering that deal which then led to uh, us trying to overthrow and successfully successfully overthrowing Yanukovych in Ukraine, which led to the Russians uh, reunifying with Crimea. I refuse to use the word annex because it's not what happened. Um, and then Putin then turns around and um, stabilizes Syria by moving in militarily in uh, October 2015 after the JCPOA is signed. Now, that sets the stage for everything. And all of a sudden, the losing streak Right, Putin is the architect of a lot of little losses. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And it starts to give a lot of people some ideas. I've, I've, I've noted immediately the change in Central Asia and the Middle Eastern politics at that point, because it was very obvious that the big bad globalist oligarchy would use the United States military to run around the world like Godzilla, stamping out any, um, any opposition to their rule. Hmm. The Brits would happily, through MI6 and the British Foreign Service, would, would happily set the stage with, uh, you know, with uh, intelligence on the ground and operations on the ground and in the media, the BBC being a, 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 a big mouthpiece for this. Hmm. And then, you know, then eventually, you know, they could, they could just tell their lies about how the world worked up until the moment when Putin went into Syria and blew up the whole myth of ISIS in three weeks. Yeah. Okay. And so once that happened, you could start to see the shifts in geopolitics. You could start to see Erdogan getting cold feet about wanting to take over all of you know, his neo-Ottoman dreams. You could see things shifting within Saudi Arabia and, and um, in Israeli politics. You could see Iran being more aggressive. You could see problems in India and Pakistan. You could see it happening everywhere. Mm. We, we try and spin up a conflict in Nagorno-Karabakh in, in, between Armenia and Azerbaijan. It goes nowhere. Like all of a sudden, all of these little moments become really, really important because, mm -hmm. well, in the past they weren't because we always won. Now yeah. we start losing those battles. So then when we get to the big battles of Brexit and Trump, all of a sudden the losing streak is now sincere because now the agenda has to be accelerated. Yeah. Now things have to change. Now the timelines have to change. Now markers have to be called in. Now all of this. Mm -hmm. And this is what brings us to COVID. Yeah. Trump had to be removed from office, period. By hook, crook, or, or theft, he had to be removed from office. And the United States had to be accelerated towards a, liquidate, uh, a liquidation event. Yeah, okay. just, just on, um, I may, it might make more sense, but 
so if, if it's going to be a complex answer, we can get to it later. But in terms of the sort of the immense desperation to get rid of Trump when, mm -hmm. you know, when they did, what's the reason behind that? Is it, is it that the, that the, the financial system was so broken that basically there yes. wasn't enough time. It was such a ticking time bomb that another four years would have meant we've got the wrong people in charge. Well, there's two things. One, Trump stopped everything cold for four years and actually started to reverse very important things, yeah. right? They knew that they would run out of time because they owned all of these olds in, you know, British parliament, the American parliament, you know, American Congress, the Italian Congress, uh, the Italian political system, the, 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 the German, everything was shaping up that all of these old boomers and all these old silent generation types um, who've been in power forever, they're not going to make it to 86 years old in power. Like they had to move. They didn't have the next generation groomed and they yeah. weren't going to, and they had to move everything forward a generation. Yeah. So they had to get rid of Trump for a number of reasons. One, Trump finally understood what the game was. I mean, he always knew what the what the problem was. He didn't Broadly, realize but, the hmm. depth of the depravity and the depth of the corruption. Yeah. And it overwhelmed him. And he wasn't the right person to take on that job. Mm. If he had been a stronger character made of mm. sterner stuff, he yeah, would have. Mm. If he was made of the same stuff that Putin is made of, who put his, who when he took power, put his family in isolation and then went after the oligarchs. Yeah. No, Trump puts his family in the freaking White House. Yeah. Okay, the that's the difference between the two men. Mm. So Trump had to be gotten rid of because four more years of Trump would have derailed everything because by that point, he understood what the problem was. They had run out of you know, neocons to fill his cabinet with. There, he would have swept the board with a bunch mm. of his own people in Congress and then they would have remade the United States politically. Yeah. And the bureaucracy would have been neutered. The EPA would have been gutted. The Department of Education would have been gutted. The Department of Energy would have been torn down and, and exposed as a as a as, as a as an off budget the department of the DOE, uh, the, the the department of DOD. Sorry, I yeah. mean all of this stuff would have started to fall apart. And when you say and when you say they would they would have remade the United States alternatively, I'm assuming you're talking about the. The I'm talking about group, Trump and the and, and the populist elements. Oh, oh you mean okay? They that would have, Trump yeah, and yeah. company would have, would have actually yeah, started yeah. the populist transformation of the United States. Trump yeah. was setting up in a second term to like a like a Reagan esque first term. Mm. Now the problem is, so they had to get rid of him, and they had to manufacture a Democrat majority in Congress. And there's only one way to do that. I hate they'd say this. They threw a virus at us. They created mm. a pandemic. And then they blamed everything that went wrong in our handling of the pandemic by packing the stats and everything else and pushing the, and pushing the, the, the narrative the way they did to bifurcate the country and make sure that the split between left and right was irrevocable. Yeah. And then blame Trump for everything. And so you and say, and yeah. then, and manufacture the consent that he wasn't a popular president, which was nonsense. And then they just went in and just manufactured 12 million freaking votes. That's what they did. Yeah. You know? And um, so, yeah, in terms of the, the virus, so you'll take it, so it was a, a sort of bioweapon of sorts. Oh, it's absolutely a bioweapon. Yeah. And um, I wasn't so convinced of this early on, but I am now. You are now. I mean, yeah, it does become harder and harder not to to see that. It's quite opportune, if not really. But um, and, and, so and, I, and I firmly believe that Davos has been trying to blame the Chinese for it. Yeah. I think they're the ones that released it. And they yeah. released it in China and blamed the Chinese Wuhan laboratory on it because, because Fauci and Birx and all these people all work for them. Yeah. Like when you, when you map it out, because what, what do you want to do? If you lose the Democrats after they try to destroy the United States for two years, which is the natural political uh, fallout, right? You try to destroy the U.S., you know, take away our food, take, you know, make energy too expensive, raise our taxes, blah, 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 blah. Spend this in the, in, even further in the debtor's prison, which was their plan, which was mostly derailed. Um, the Democrats are going to be out of office it, it, by the midterms. The GOP is going to take over. Now you, now you get behind a GOP who, has, who can blame China for killing 100, for a couple hundred thousand Americans mm. in a pandemic, which, is, which was the narrative they've desperately have tried to create. Well, really, yeah, I'm really behind this particular talking point. And, and, and it's because it's, it's not to... I haven't talked about this stuff in ages, but this, I've been, I've been, I, I wrote about all this and talked about it 
all, all during like 2021. Yeah, but, yeah. But I, you know, I mean, specifically the China one, because, you know, it's not mm-hmm. even to go out and say China are friends. It's just, if the only thing that comes out of this is like, you know, the, the kind of horrendous way and the utter decimation of like the, the average people in Europe and America, if the only thing that comes out of this is and fuck China. Chi- it's fuck China. It's just, a, it's just, an, you know, it's it going to be an absolute tragedy. So I think. I, oh, it is. It's, it's, it's unbelievable. I mean, yeah. this, all of this is just, it's just, this is to give you the, uh, an idea of the level of ruthlessness of these people. Yeah. Okay. And so that's what we're dealing with. Yeah. I, I, this is where, I mean, this is, this is, I could see this coming the minute they pivoted off of the lab leak theory back in May of 2021, mm-hmm. sent John Stewart out on the Stephen Colbert to do the song, the dog and pony show the, that, you know, uh, oh no, it's all China. I'm like, that's absolutely a you know they're trying to push everybody now to believing that china did this so that we don't believe that the globalists who actually were the architects of this and are pushing the technocratic you know orwellian super state on us that they that that they're out there talking about it's it's, it's, it's all such it's all such patent nonsense it's all such overcomplicated patent purposefully confusing nonsense the truth of the matter is is a bunch of old european colonialist money wants to take over the freaking world and they want to implement global communism because they thought that the last time they got they did this they only got russia and china they didn't get europe and the united states now they think they can do it worldwide and this is how they're going to do it and now the reverse is on now we got the reverse situation we've got communism in 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 intellectually embedded deeply into the west while whereas the russians and the chinese are going no dude it's not a really good idea but we're going to look like but we're going to have to like you know strengthen the state mm in order to fight you and then we'll and then we'll get back to liberalizing afterwards and and, and i firmly believe that if we when we look ahead to when i'm not getting my social security check when i'm in my mid-60s the chinese ccp will not be in power but china will still be the dominant economic power of the world Mm. okay so but between now and then they're going to look an awful lot like you know they're going to look an awful lot like a an authoritarian top-down authoritarian yeah yeah um because they have to so yeah no i that's something that resonates with me as well um now in t- so you just quickly on the on covid and the virus and, and and all that kind of stuff so you speak you spoke of it then as a reason to get rid of trump um so mm-hmm. you don't view it as you know there's also there's obviously all the stuff around digital ids they're the oh yeah, that, yeah yeah i i, I so think it's that sort I, of a swiss all, army knife oh yeah yeah this is like yeah. this is this, this is not just a geopolitical two for a three for a four for this is like a 12 this is like a 12 bagger like yeah, they get it, it from science. every angle imaginable yeah, yeah, no, yeah absolutely perfect and so um just just to touch on so that was a good rundown of the geopolitics in terms of the financial mm-hmm. situation um i guess we that was probably broken in 2008 already and it's right. just clever financial engineering has just been managed to managing to keep it going and then so in 2019 there's the repo crisis yes um do you want to talk is, is that a oh yeah i'll be happy to talk about well? it. Talk so let's talk so let's, so let's do this yeah well. i mean I, i've talked about this at, at length let's let's go back a little bit so one of the things i said at the outset is that you know you're constantly updating your mental map about how things operate right well the repo crisis i have new opinions about over the last as i've interpreted as i've looked at stuff over the last year and i've reinterpreted events moreover the the Financial crisis of 2008 was the end of the dollar reserve standard. No one likes to talk about it in these terms because they don't understand it, but it's the dollar reserve standard broke in 2008. What you wound up with, and then we had about two or three years worth of people like scrambling around trying to keep the system together. And then in September of 2011 was birthed the coordinated central bank standard, where now all the major central banks coordinated monetary policy in order to keep all the asset prices from falling. And we, we did- 2011. Yeah, that would be the top of the gold bull market in September of 2011 when they announced $500 billion swap lines between the top seven major central banks. That's what broke the gold market. Mm -hmm. That's what broke the gold bull market. That morning, that announcement happened, gold drops $150 and then it never recovers. So now, um, that system lasted until 2019, 2021, I think really 2021. Yeah. Okay. Who who organized that? Who's leading? Oh, that would be Bernanke and Davos and all the rest of it. They, uh, there B- was that was a BIS willing. That's, and- that was one of those we're winning moments. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, all yeah. Of the major central banks got together. Yellen and Bernanke both were Davos through and through, selling out the United States, accelerating 
using China's mercantilism to hollow out U.S. manufacturing and everything else. The Chinese sat there for 20, 30 years going, oh, wow, you're going to allow us to run a mercantilist script for 30 years? Oh, okay, great. I mean, we expected 10, maybe 15, and you're going to give us 30? Okay, we'll take it. Because we, because our stupid elites honestly thought that they were buying influence within the CCP with all of that money that was flowing into China, their money. And then China nationalized it all or bankrupted them all. And Soros now thinks that- And now that, he's bitching about that. And now he's yeah. bitching about it and he calls Xi the devil after yeah. he loses billions in Evergrande. Yeah. Okay. This is the, that's the setup. So the central bank, coordinated central bank standard lasts- I haven't decided. I think it actually lasts until June 16, 2021. The repo crisis was the first reverberation because Martin Armstrong has made this point multiple times, which is that at the beginning of 2019, the US banks refused to accept euro, euro denominated debt or euro sovereign debt as repo collateral, yeah. which was the beginning of the split between European banks and American banks. American banks are saying, no way are we taking this junk at yielding negative 0.6%. We're not taking your German bunds that are 75% overvalued as, mm. you know, as good as, you know, at par for a repo contract. You can go, you can go scratch. Yeah. So, so they're, they're risking being brought down with the, the European ship at that point, which is completely right. Which is the way it's always worked in the past. Financially, yeah. Since so, yeah, in terms of so, yeah. so the, just so, so to understand so that sure, the repo yeah. crisis of 2019 was an outgrowth of that new effective relationship yeah. and the fed comes in does what they're supposed to do which is to provide elastic money to help the u.s banks support that policy mm. so what happens about six months later we get covid yeah and the fed was already creating a self-tightening scenario by allowing american banks to not repo to not allow um the use Euro debt is a repo collateral, and thereby it was already putting mm. pressure on the euro dollar markets. It was already creating what Jeff Snyder called euro dollar three or whatever it was. And now mm. he's talking, but now we're into euro dollar four, whatever his nomenclature is. Yeah, um, yeah. But I knew then that that would last about six months because the market would give the Fed six months to work stuff out. And then, so it was, you know, we were going to get a financial crisis in, in, in March of 2020, regardless. Davos just added COVID on top of it to force the Fed to monetize trillions of dollars and use Trump as the vehicle for this. And um, the CARES Act, all of that stuff. And that forced Powell to go back on his, his stated policy of getting control of American monetary policy and working for America. He had to go along with, he couldn't not do what Congress told him to do at that point because Congress pushed through this ridiculous CARES Act, which forced all this money into this into the world that the fed was then forced to monetize because so, there was no appetite for it he didn't want to do this but he was forced into it because yeah. ultimately congress if congress allocates and spends that kind of money and the treasury department um you know prints the bonds the fed and the primary dealers are honor bound to buy those bonds like if no one else will it's it's law yeah so so all this yeah so all the u.s all the money printing particularly in the u.s because the u.s i believe printed a hell of a lot more than anyone else that yeah, well was, they have that was that was a kind of more of a Davos European. That was Davos initiative. forcing us if, to if, pay. If, and notice that the ECB didn't spend any. That the Europe didn't didn't do any QA. If yeah, if the, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, and and the class and here's the so best. They were going to take the bill. They were going to fit. fit yeah. The well, no, they were going to. Yeah. Else. Well, what they were doing was the creating a, 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 what they were what they were doing was creating a, a, an environment where America looked like it was in, in trouble financially and politically and culturally and everything else. And Europe was. They were still acting fiscally responsibly. We still have a current account surplus. We still have a trade surplus. Our currency is strong. We're insouciant and wise Europeans. And What's doing wrong this with you people? What's wrong with the Yanks? This is classic. This is classic European. Um, uh, 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 this is classic playing on American love of uh, American Europhiles. Yeah. Sentiments. They and because we, we have tons of them here, and most of the American left is very much Europhilic. Yeah, and they and, knew they could use that to their advantage. And they're doing this because essentially because they want to freeze capital flight from Europe yes, to the they US. Because yes, their, exactly. their banks are screwed, the currency's screwed. The right, you've got all this screwed. debt way overvalued. The target two imbalances are exploding left and right. Yeah. I mean, every, and remember, this is something else that I didn't know at the time when I started putting all this together. But because I, I read it somewhere, it was very important 
very, very important point, which is that in the United States, credit creation mostly happens through, through, through corporate bond issuance, mm -hmm. right? And, you know, we have companies like Apple. We want to create a whole lot of credit. We, you know, Apple or whoever, they create a whole lot of corporate debt, which then gets sold into the marketplace. It's not a lot of direct bank loans. Mm -hmm. In Europe, it's a lot of direct bank loans, which is why the Europeans are so focused on keeping the banks from failing. We can have banks go under here and it have the banks can be in trouble here, but our corporates could be okay. Okay. So the corporate bond market may be okay. It's more, more important to watch the IG9 or basically watch um, LQD and JNK, you know, you can keep uh, corporate debt ETFs and watch their prices versus watching, you know, uh, the, the, the Euro Bank 60 or whatever the, the, that index is. Yeah. For example, and to so, clarify, you can the reason that the commercial uh, banks are allowed to fail in the U.S. is just because the the Fed have an easier lever to to basically well, yeah, stop well, a, a, they, a they can get into trouble, and the, and the Fed has has the ability to create unlimited amounts of Whereas elastic money. Much, yeah, so it would be a lot more deep. Whereas the ECB the, doesn't have Europe. this, yeah. yeah. And the, whereas the ECB doesn't have that that okay. that mechanism at all, and they have the problem that most of the debt is direct bank debt. Yeah. So that when the debt starts to fail, the banks are immediately in trouble and the BCB doesn't have a mechanism by which to bail anybody out. They have to create, you know, a shell game where they get the member central banks to pick up the debt, mostly the Bundesbank at this point in Germany. So basically you use the Bundesbank as the way we use the Fed, right? Yeah. yeah. So now knowing that, now you can see the setup for where we are today. Okay which is that on June 16th, 2021, this coordinated central bank system ended. And it was ended not by a market event, but by a decision by the FOMC. Yeah. Where they raised the reverse repo payout rate that they were paying out to reverse repos to American banks by five basis points above the Fed funds rate. Mm -hmm. Okay. That ended the bull market in the euro. Turbocharge the balance on the reverse repo facility, sterilizing a whole bunch of American spending. It's now stuck getting five basis points over whatever the Fed is paying. And it drained over $1 trillion in base money from the offshore dollar markets, mostly in Europe. And to a lesser extent, Hong Kong. Yep. And yeah, so you're carrying on. Yeah, continue. So when you've got, so that, and, and I want you to understand, everybody to understand, that's like draining $1 trillion of literal cash and savings out of the American economy. That's M0, folks. That's not M2. That's not M1. It's not M3. It's M0. It's the kind of money that the Fed prints when they do QE. When M3 is collapsing, when credit money is collapsing, all the central banks can do is create M0 to shore up the base of the yeah. inverted pyramid that is the capital structure, where we have a little bit of gold, some currency, some stocks, a lot of credit. Extra's pyramid in, is a reverse, is a pyramid on its point, right? All we do is, all the central banks do is pack the, the base as it starts to, as the, the pyramid starts to teeter. They just buy the shitty assets, it's, do they, too? Is the, is, the, is the fat in the foundation mm. by packing sand around the foundation, but it's still going to collapse eventually. And, they keep, and it's just this unstable pyramid that wants to fall over and collapse completely or get really small in order to be able to stabilize itself. Yeah. One or the other. And who gets screwed by that? Well, all the people who live their lives by making money on money, by all the finance, is by by all the, the the rentier class, known as the oligarchs, known as Davos, like that's who we're talking about. So now, that was the moment the Fed went to war with everybody else, and they went to war with the ECB, and they went to war with Davos. And I firmly believe that it was because they realized during the COVID movement that that's when the big reveal of what the plan was, which was, oh, the commercial banks, we don't need those anymore. We can just issue central bank digital currencies. Everybody can have an account directly with the central bank. And if you need a loan, well, you know, we can have a social credit score to decide whether or not you, you know, can, you can buy a pizza, get a loan, buy a car, get married, blah, 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 blah. And the commercial banking interest in the United States 
is by far the biggest and most powerful lobby in the world. It's not more powerful than the military industrial complex. It's not more powerful than anybody else. The commercial banks in the United States, otherwise known as the New York boys, are far more powerful than everybody else. And they've proven it over the last seven, 13 months. Yeah. Because they've engineered a massive bull, bull market in the US dollar. They have pretty much destroyed the euro dollar markets, which took 50 years to build into a, an offshore um, dollar juggernaut. And and, and have empowered and, and, are, and are literally in the process of ripping apart every major political institution inside Europe, including the European Union. And yeah. they did this in 13 months. So to so so the US commercial banks are are basically yeah, they're, they're striking back. Now if we if we kind Absolutely. of if we kind of um zoom out a bit and and kind of trace things backwards, let's mm. you know, so after so after the Second World War um, is this like, because, you know, the U.S. banks, you know, the CFR has been very powerful, was established in sort of sure. like 1920. They've been powerful for a long time. So sure. are you basically, so has the, the alignment incentives changed at some point? Yeah. They've, they've, always, been, they've some, always been at, very powerful. Yeah, so well, at, at point, some, so yeah, your, well, thesis some that, your thesis is that basically at some point, and this happened quite recently. Yes. Um, they just realized how shit you know they they kind of had certain alliances with people in europe they had enough alignment of incentives they were going on general globalism was good for the u.s right financial system financial imperialism and the rest of it but when we now get to we now get to breaking point um and when davos reveal their plans and then it starts yeah they start to realize actually we need to um well let's put it this way seb if you've got a bunch of giants and one set of giants says we want to be in charge when the other set of giants who are actually more powerful say, ah, uh, no. Yeah. What do you think is going to happen? I, I, I make it really personal. I go, do you really think that a disagreeable Greek bastard like Jamie Dimon, the CEO of JP Morgan, is going to turn over JP Morgan Chase and the commercial banking power of the United States, uh, of, the, of, of New York, to a bunch of German Malthusian eugenicists? Do you really think that? Yeah, because that's what we're dealing with. When you break it down to brass tacks, at the end of the day, Diamond sits there with a with a 24, five-year-old scotch in one hand and a cigar in the other, going, dudes, are we really gonna do this? Are we gonna allow these German are we gonna allow these German idiots to, to run the table on us? Of course they aren't. Yeah. And, and I've talked to too many people within the American banking system. The more I, I get I get traction on this idea, more people, professionals in the markets come to me and go, dude, you're absolutely right. I see it everywhere. The yeah. problem is, is that JP Morgan has got just as much of a bureaucratic problem mm. Diamond does that Donald Trump had when he was president. So at yeah. times, all of this stuff looks really, you know, it looks really chaotic and it looks like, you know, they're not winning or they're, you know, it, and, but the, the truth of the matter is, is that the broad stroke of it is, is very clear. Yeah. They haven't so, been able to take down the Fed. They haven't been able to get control of it. Powell's doing what he wants and he's doing what he's been he's been wanting to do since he took power in 2018. Yeah, that's why um that one of the reasons why these recent yeah, these recent arguments of yours resonated is when I was looking when I took the time to look into CBDCs and the proposed architecture. I mean, that was one of right. the obvious questions, right? Like unless you you could kind of subscribe to a really sort of like simplistic view and you think it's all one grand table and you know, it's all one team and the rest of it. You're like, well, what are these banks? Like, are they good? They're going to be glorified like crypto, like a glorified right. crypto hedge fund. Are they at best? They might kind of be, you know, compete for the, you know, the payment infrastructure to actually deliver right. payments right. and stuff like, but it's going to be, it's going to be horrendous. So I, I was asking the same question. So, and also you're just thinking like, there's got to be some disagreement at the global level. Like there's got, you know, we aren't living, this is it's too esoteric for me to think that it's just one, you know, it's just kind of one agency, right? You, you know, no, you I mean, otherwise, otherwise none of us are, right. Un yeah. Otherwise oh, none of us are real and yeah. we're all living in a Phil Dickian style, you yeah. know, psychotic projection of a semi of a psychotic demiurge or something. I mean, literally I just don't buy that. Yeah. I, yeah. Because as a liberty, as a libertarian, as, a, as an Austrian economist, I, 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 I always want to bring it back to that. My filter is very simple. I believe in incentives, and I believe incentives matter. And I believe yeah. people respond to incentives. And when they're given negative incentives, they either work around them or, or they ignore them or they shut down yeah. as to not be affected by them. And all of those things are net negative for the people who are trying to 
to control them. Yeah. And therefore, it always raises the cost of them trying to control them, trying to implement systems of control. And those systems of control are never as efficient as the, as the, as the, the, the narcissist in charge here think it's going to be. They always put these models forth like, oh, it's going to be more efficient. It'll be more, it'll be better. It'll be this, it'll be that. We'll have utopia. And then it always winds up being the exact opposite because no one wants to live like that. And mm -hmm. therefore, they just sit back and go, you know what? No, we'll just have a barbecue. Yeah. Like, no, we'll just, I'll just not drive my car. I'll just not do, I'll just not produce any food. I'll just, I won't, you know, I won't do what you want me to do. And, um, yeah, you know, you're going to have to come up, you're going to have to come up with the difference in incentives to get me to, to come off the couch. And when that happens, it, it, the, the, the system invariably is always far more expensive than they think it is. Their, their models fail. They're not, and worse, they're not even linear. You know, there's none of this is a linear response curve. It's all a non-linear response curve to their ridiculous freaking um, edicts. And so at the end of the day, the farther you push people away from their, where they want to go, well, the more energy it takes to get them to go back to where you want to go. And that curve is not yeah. a linear curve. It's exponential because, dude, I'm a chemist. It's just like putting electrons together. It's just like putting two electrons together. At some point, you know, yeah, like, like hey, let's bond. Hey, yeah, let's bond. Yeah. This is they're nice. Pure, pure let's, go, let's, get, let's get closer together. And then all of a sudden, the energy curve between the two, you move them a little bit closer together, and the energy goes, of the system goes through the roof. Yeah. Like really quickly. Yeah, no, they, they, it's so that I think this sort of like technocratic, sort of very like science obsessed mindset really dominates their thinking and that, you know, they really think that people, you know, they, they can't not conceive of us as like kind of cells in a spreadsheet and as kind of perfectly really movable do. atoms and stuff like that. They do, right? And so, and ultimately, you're pushing up against um, natural law um, and so and physics and yeah. the Gibbs free energy equation. Hey, pick your poison, dude. The yeah. Nernst equation. Pick pick one of them. It's all the same. Yeah, and so that's what they, that's where they are. And at some point, you know, you just have to look at it and say, okay, um, where's everybody's incentive? Who do they work for? And who do they who do we think they work for? And and whatnot. And then they start answering. They start asking those questions. Then simply start answering them. And you know, Davos is a group that has split into multiple factions at this point. Yeah. Which is the main reason why you know that they're losing. Yeah. So, so a couple of questions on sure. this. So, so let's, um, so basically after World War II, um, you know, generally for elites in the West, growing West, the West's imperialism, kind of growing American hegemony sort of makes everyone rich, everyone's happy. We, you know, the system starts to run out of steam. 2021, 20, or you know, 29, 20, 2008, 2019, you, right. you name it. 2021 um, starts to, you know, it starts to the pie starts getting smaller, and so there's more infighting. People mm -hmm. like Jamie Dimon and the commercial bank lobby in America gets a feel, you know, like BIS start talking about, okay, this is what the CBDC architecture is going to look like. So they, so they start. So all in all, you start having this split and. The Fed, who are immense, sorry, the the commercial banks who have a lot of influence over people like Jerome Powell, they start to you know they start to organize now. One one question. Well, just, uh, let's, let's, let's let's make something very clear. The commercial banks are the ones who put Jerome Powell in power. So do you? So did they put Trump in power as well? Then no, they didn't. No, we did. They didn't. No, we did. Who'd, we did. We did. The people did. You think you're absolutely no? I that, think yeah. I think they tried to cheat like you wouldn't believe, and Trump won by just won by enough that they couldn't. Yeah. They couldn't. I mean, that's why Hillary didn't 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 concede for twelve hours. Like they they were trying to run the numbers to see if they could make it work, yeah, and then and they published numbers that made it look like she won. No, 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 absolutely not. The but once Trump was in power, he had to appease they, them somehow, and so no, he no, chose no, no, their no, man. No, no. Once they once they had once Trump was in power, we saw an opportunity. They saw an opportunity. Okay, and right. that's when they got, and that's when they. His his nickname is Private Equity Powell. He doesn't come from the the same ivory tower as Bernanke and Yellen and all the rest of them. He's not an intellectual. Mm -hmm. He's a guy who's actually put money on the table. He's a guy who's actually made his money honest, well, mostly honestly, in private equity, which is a far different mindset and a far different set of imprinting and tools and everything else and skill set than guys like Bernanke. And or Janet Yellen, and you know, because at this point, is Janet Yellen even a woman? Because can we even define that at this point? <laughs> the so, my you know, when you when you look at Fed, when you have when you look at Powell, you have to realize that. And you know, 
I did, I always started with, I, does anybody believe private equity Powell would sell out the commercial banks who put him in power in the first place? Trump yeah. complained about Powell the entire time he was in office because Trump is a is a real estate developer who likes low interest rates and yeah. thinks, and is a mercantilist just like the Chinese are. So he was easy to manipulate into going along with the CARES Act, going along with all the money printing, going along with, you know, budget expansion and all the rest of it because he wasn't a fiscal conservative. Yeah. Okay. And why does um why does Powell get reelected um, under um, under Biden? Biden? Uh, yeah, did Davos you see the fight that Biden. they did? They, really, they, they, they push did, back did you see the fight that went? No, this is important. Did you see the fight? the fight went on for six months? I, I I I went on I went on about this day. I wrote about this daily. Yeah, he was supposed to be reconfirmed in October of 2021. They put it off. And they tried to get the yeah, case, they wanted like to get build back better and the yeah. infrastructure bill and the debt ceiling raised before and then they were going to get all those passed and then they were going to throw Powell under the bus put in Lael Brainerd do MMT and all the rest of it. it didn't work Mansion and Cinema held the line now Jan Mansion and Cinema hold the line why not because they're patriots or because they're they're so wise and associate no it's because the commercial because Jamie Dimon and Goldman Sachs and freaking city group we're standing behind them going no you we will protect you davos will not kill you and they won't kill your family we've yeah. got your back they have enough you leverage over, no. they, they have enough leverage over these people basically at this point um and so one thing that occurred to me it, it makes a lot of sense if you trace the the lineage you see trump you know you see Powell comes in um we can talk about so for after but um mm -hmm. So what what's the difference in Europe then? So European commercial banks are just as implicated by CBDC by CBDC system. Did yeah, but they're all, see, they're all bankrupt. Did they're we see a, they don't have any leverage? That's no, they have point. no leverage over the ECB. They they said they surrendered their sovereignty when they when they created the the EU okay. and the ECB. So the like, so the American banks actually have somewhat. The, the yeah, we have. A, we're sovereign. I mean, relatively shape. speaking, we have a we have a far stronger constitution. So we have far have stronger no contract, rule of yeah. law, contract law, everything else and in the, the United States. And the way the power rolls up in the US is, is different. I guess in, in, in Davos, the European banks, it's a bit more bureaucratic, and so there's a bit more of an entrenched You guys are not free. Yeah. Um, you guys don't have any rights. Okay, you don't. It's not enshrined in your constitution. We, the people, delegate these powers to our government. And it doesn't work that way. All of, your, all, of the con all, the, all the constitutions and the charters within in Europe, and certainly if you're in the EU, you have no rights. But how is this they are sovereign to... over you. Even your, even the Queen is sovereign over y'all, which is yeah, actually yeah. better than 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 the current nightmare that you guys live under. But we yeah. have a different system in the United States. The presupposition is that in, and the it's the U.S. Constitution that is the document they are trying to destroy, and they're trying to constantly do bureaucratic end runs around. But the and and then pack the judiciary with a bunch of people who can't read. Okay, how, we have people, we have judges who to, literally can't read in this country. But how how does this roll up to leverage that Wall Street, that the Wall Street lobby lobby and the commercial bank lobby has over over the Fed? Because well, it, they can because, because they own the Fed. Their things are structured a bit. They different. own the no no they they own the Fed literally own the Fed. Do you so understand they, that the that the New York the bank of the the, the them, Fed is a private institution owned and the shareholders of the New York Fed are 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 J P Morgan Goldman Sachs Bank of New York Mellon all the primary dealers own shares the in the Federal Reserve. But the executive is selected through. By the by, the president. But right? the, so the, but the chair of the FOMC the, is appointed, yeah. is is selected, is uh, is is recommended by the president and confirmed by Congress. That's the power sharing rule. Okay, so there there the is a, there is a bit of a tussle there, but in in really simple terms, so the the U.S. commercial banks want to resist the CBD system. They have the leverage to do so because mm -hmm. they they have leverage over the Fed. Things well, they own the Fed, they, they and own, they have leverage then over all the politicians that they buy. Yeah, okay. they, but it's you know strictly them owning them is you know the picture's you know a bit more complicated than that because it's not it doesn't come purely down to that right like as in they. Well, have I mean, it manage. kind of it kind of does at, at when you have a divided Congress. Yeah. And when you have a Congress with only a three-seat majority on the part of Democrats and nobody likes, and you have a completely divided Senate, it comes down to one vote. Yeah. So so okay. 
Uh, but we don't need to, we don't need to debate that too much because the broad picture makes sense. And um, in term, in Europe, the European banks they just don't have this leverage because the they just they they've been suffocated they, by the EU by the bureaucracy by the state is a, has just a bit more like they, well, of, they don't own their the countries the the central the the member central banks don't own their own reserves. Their, their central banks, were however they're constituted, however they're chartered, they don't have any control because they're subordinate to the ECB. Yeah. They're subordinate to the European Court of Justice. They're subordinate to the yeah. European Commission. So they and can't the do anything. Thereof. And have they been no, crying they're, about they're it at all? Uh, like the, have they been like CEO? They cry Deutsche about Bank? it, but they're, have they like, been no, crying the, about the bank, it? They, just, they, like they all should have went bankrupt in 2008. Okay, yeah. And, and um, they didn't. Yeah, and in you bailed them of, out for fourteen years or for twelve years. The Powell's not bailing them out anymore, and everybody's yeah. screaming and everybody's angry. And how, you know, the Fed obviously released a report looking into CBDCs. Is that just appearances, or do you, how seriously yeah. do you? They you, don't. You, you don't think that's, um, that's now Powell. Every time it comes up, Powell says, "Oh, let's let's have some uh, graduate student write another paper." You need now. to have it, yeah, just to kind of keep up appearances. It, yeah, no, he has to keep it. Okay, you don't take Absolutely. that too seriously. Okay, no, I never, I never have. Every time until he says pilot project. Okay. Um, so no, it, it you know, like I said, the reason that this argument resonated with me was because that was one of the obvious things, which is what happens, you know, what happens to the commercial banks, right? So they're fighting back, and just to tie things together, you also you also talk about so they're looking to disentangle themselves from Europe, which is bankrupt, which is screwing over their finances, but also like politically, strategically, it's kind of trying to get them. It's trying to basically put them, make them subsidiary to. <laughs> to the European powers and the rest of it. Um, kind of tying this together to, to add credence to your narrative, you also speak about the shift from LIBOR to mm-hmm. the secure overnight funding rate. Do you want to quickly talk about that? Because I think that- Yeah, let's, let's, let's do this. So this. I, I've already laid out that the American banks don't want to repo, don't want to take as collateral Euro, Euro bonds, right? They haven't done so really for like four years. Um, the first thing that goes in that starts that, that once Powell, and I, I think I missed a book earlier, Powell was, was appointed in 2017. Um, and John Williams was appointed to the head of the Atlanta Fed in 2017. And Williams has been the guy who was charged with implementing SOFR. Now, SOFR is an idea that has been bandied around since before the financial crisis of 2008. Under Obama, it went nowhere for eight years. Geithner put the, put the kibosh on it because, again, the, Obama literally works for dollars. He's and at this point, he's like their Manchurian candidate. He truly is the Manchurian candidate, but it was never the Chinese or the Russians that were trying to infiltrate the United States. It was European commies, not Russian or Chinese commies. Now, the first thing that happens once Powell and, and, and Williams are ensconced at the Fed is they begin to implement SOFR, and it starts to go into effect in 2017 with a four-year rollout, whereas by the beginning of 2022, all new debt in the United States will be indexed to the secured overnight funding rate rather than LIBOR. And any legacy debt, you know, will be, should get rolled out. And a lot of it has gotten rolled out. And, and this is SOFR is, a, and so, and so SOFR is a market rate based on interbank transactions that what the banks are actually buying and selling their, um, you know, they're buying, they're buying and selling dollars for within the com- domestic banking money markets here in the United States. And LIBOR is an interest rate set by 18 European banks, well, sorry, 17 European banks and J.P. Morgan's London office yeah. at the end of every day via phone call. Something we already know is compromised. Yeah. So here's the gig. So let's kind of lay this out. Very simple. When the Fed wants to raise interest rates, the euro, and, and does so, and the cost of dollars rises, the euro dollar, euro dollar futures fall, to commensurately with how much they think the Fed is going to, and the curve then tries to chart out where they think the Fed interest rate policy is going to be over time. That cost of capital uh, for dollars rises, therefore the euro should fall, euro dollar should fall, and and um, that should cur- curtail dollar-based credit creation within the offshore banking system, primarily within the uh, European banking system. Now, Take that one step further. What did I say earlier? Most of the, the credit created in Europe is through bank debt, not corporate debt. Therefore, the minute there's any change within the um, within the the availability and the liquidity of offshore dollars, offshore dollar credit, interest rates are going to rise, and it's going to show up in LIBOR. Now, if LIBOR rises because because European banks are in trouble because you know 
bank debt's failing and the work and NPLs are rising, non-performing loan per percentages are rising, or what we call the Texas ratio for commercial banks starts to, to rise and, and the bank's uh, balance sheet starts to degrade, what happens? The banks start scrambling around for dollars in order to get through their payday loans and they go and they and they index that to LIBOR. The bank, the LIBOR panel gets together and they say, well, you know, they're selling, I'm selling at 2%, I'm selling at 2.1, let's set it at 2.05 and we'll go from there. Meanwhile, over in the United States, none of this is going on. But all the debt is indexed to LIBOR. So one day Instead LIBOR is at 1.5%. Yeah. Tomorrow, like the, the, you know, we hear about some third rate Austrian bank starts to go belly up and LIBOR shoots out to 5%. All of a sudden your variable rate mortgage, your HELOC, your credit card, your car loan, whatever, shoots up four, bait, four points yeah. because it's indexed to LIBOR. Now, if it's indexed to SOFR and SOFR is a market rate, that doesn't happen. You guys are able to, to make your own decisions without being implicated by what's going on in Europe. So... Um, SOFR is the mechanism by which the Fed regains control over its own monetary policy, thereby ending the, the, the primacy of the euro dollar offshore credit creation system, shadow banking system, to set monetary policy for the Fed. It's always why the Fed has always had to pivot the minute they try to, to raise rates. They've always had to then turn around and bail out Europe. Yeah. So a couple of questions on this. First one is, it sounds like LIBOR kind of you know worked more in the interests of the city of london absolutely um so how was that secured in the first place when was libor introduced and did oh it speak- god it's, a, it's ancient. ancient i mean it goes back to when it goes i mean it libor is over 100 years old it goes back to when money markets began like so, we okay, had to so have some meet- so it speaks but, to the legacy of kind of city yeah. of london banks being you know being the big and the frankfurt big, and amsterdam and, and the rest, rest of it yeah, and so absolutely. it was just it was just and i suppose there was a early on when the u.s empire you know, when America grew and the U.S. empire grew and the rest of it, there was, it made enough sense to keep it going at that point. We but didn't have, we never, from the moment that the Americans declared independence, y'all have been trying to get your colonies back. Yeah. Okay, let's, not, I mean, got news for you. That's the way we see it. That's, that's the way anybody with a half, you know, with three functioning brain cells sees it. It's what the War of 1812 is about. That's yeah. what the civil, I mean, that's what, I mean, Alex Craner and I were talking about this yesterday. I just published a podcast and he reminded me that like three times, like t- twice before, the Russians have come in to help the American state um, stop getting blown apart by European influence trying to explode the United States, and most notably the Civil War. Yeah. Well, what we call the Civil War, what everybody calls the U.S. Civil War, which was not a civil war. It was a war for independence of the, the South's war for independence. Yeah. But the, the point being is that it was being um, fostered by mm-hmm. British and French uh, forces to... You know, they were emboldening the South. Meanwhile, the Russians were coming in to, to support the Union because they were trying to break the, the country up, even back then. They, so you've, always wanted the, you've always wanted the, your colonies back. Yeah, That's so, the way I see the whole global fight now. They all, the European oligarchs want their colonies back. All yeah. of them. And so up until, but there wasn't the need slash the leverage to, to introduce something like SOFA. You know, to, to, there to, wasn't the technology to have a market rate to have something up so until about the 70s, yeah. certainly up until about the 70s or 80s. And then by then you're talking about this club of Rome Davos thing. They, there was an, it's not about leverage. It's about the, the it's about the, the fact that, that the federal reserve was going along with it, that the federal reserve was instituted in order to do this. It's when these people decided to take it one step further and implement an agenda that would put the United States at the hind seat and Europe back in the primary seat of this relationship the, of this power sharing relationship, it was no longer going to be the United States on top with Europe here. Yeah. It's now where Davos is trying to reverse it. And the United States is going, uh, yeah, no, yeah, sorry. No. Yeah. And, so and that's did, what's going on. And was there much of a fight in terms of, um, introducing sofa and, and yeah, well, it took 10 years. was that there was a big, there was a big fight and I mean, sure. Yeah, no, it, Obama quite, put it off for 10 years. Yeah. Cause it must be, I mean, it seems pretty existential in a lot of ways for the city of London Absolutely. and for the European bank. So there was a big, and now we're getting, and so now we're getting versions of sofa all around the world. Like yeah. LIBOR is on its last legs. The city of London, even, even in this case, city of London, even Europe wants city of London destroyed. So LIBOR is going to be, is going away. We now have Eurobor. We have HIBOR over in, over in Hong Kong. You know, we have Singapore, we have CYBOR over in Singapore, yada, yada, yada. They're all versions of the same thing, but the, and the Fed has SOFR. And yeah. so yeah. it's now the, the global coordinated bank policy where city of London and legacy Amsterdam banks 
uh, legacy, you know, le- uh, pa- you know Paris and, and, and Amsterdam banks, all of that's ending. And we're having a new system and they want that system. They still want to control that system and they want to do that via the CBDCs and then rolling up global government to the, uh, to the UN and the IMF being the world central bank. That's what they want. And they're trying to crash the entire system and force the IMF to bail out the world and then yeah. thereby extension own everything. And so, That's their plan. and so in terms of the Fed's plan, right? So you speak about the, you, know, you, you make sense of the decision to raise interest rates in this light. Um, mm-hmm. what, 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 are, what are they shooting for then? At what point do you think they'll be satisfied? Um, at what point do you, are they trying to cause a, like a bank, mass bankruptcy? They, 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 they are, they are, or yes, are they just they're, trying they're, to, they they're the, just trying to yes. get past some point where, you know, they're, 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 they're engineering a, a full on sovereign debt crisis in Europe. Yeah. They're that's a, a full on banking crisis in Europe and a political destruction of the European Union. To the point, and the Russians want, and the Russians want the same thing. To, yeah. the, from the other side, the Russians are using the energy play. On the other side, the Fed's pulling back on liquidity. The the Europe is stuck in the middle. They're a rag doll, and they're both saying pull, and they're going to so, just tear the arms off of Europe, and it's going to fall. And so, eventually, you're going to get to. You assume we'll get to the point where you know Europe is so broken they 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 can't pretend to try and you know try and rein in the U.S. and they have to come to the U.S. and say without any leverage and basically just take the U.S.'s terms. That's what you think the Fed are trying to, to engineer, basically. They're trying to get them I, I, I No, I actually just think, I, I, said, I, think you're over, I think you're overthinking it, okay? It's really simple. The U.S. wants their sovereignty back. We're not sovereign in the global scheme of things. We still have the Constitution. Yeah. Davos is trying to destroy our sovereignty by breaking, and they're going to try and break us apart. Their, ne- their next move too. after this happens is they're going to try and get New York and California to secede from the Union. That's what comes next. These but people you- are going to stop until they're bankrupted, and you bankrupt them by destroying the euro dollar system. Yeah, that's so, how you kill them. They're otherwise they're just cockroaches. So you think this is that existential? They're, they're trying to utterly decimate, and and there aren't, there yes. won't be, yeah, there won't be sort of repercussions there for for the U.S. for the financial system. Well, like, no, no, there's gonna be just, there's gonna be financial repercussions for everybody. It's gonna be flee. terrible. Yeah, but at there's least the U.S. Sort of elites, the, but from the U.S. elites' awful. perspective, at least they're gonna be, at least they're gonna have some sort of agency, right? They, the they sy- want the system is so of. broken that everybody is going to suffer. Yeah. But the question is, what does it look like on the other side? Do we have European control over a global technocratic system where Russia is subjugated as the world's commodity producer and the Chinese ultimately bankrupted because we destroyed credit creation and we destroyed their export markets and we destroyed the United States politically and Europe is, is sitting pretty at the, at the capital center with the frictionless CBDC in order to fund the world's liquidity? Or... Is the United States and Russia and the Chinese and the Iranians and the Saudi Arabians and everybody else looking at Davos going, no, that's enough. We've suffered enough at the hands of you European, you you arrogant European colonialists. We're done. Stop it. And we're going to destroy you. The Saudi Arabians are done with it. The Iranians are done with it. The Russians are done with it. The Turks are done with it. Everybody's done with these people. The Greeks are done with it. The Americans are finally done with it. But they still have enough... They still have their ticks embedded deeply in the skin of all these other countries. There's still, there's still Davos ticks embedded in the Russian financial system. There's still Dav- there's a, a number of them embedded deeply in the American political system at every level. Yeah. And we have to get rid of them all. And there's only one way to do that. You have to force them into bankruptcy. So okay. that they cannot create trillions of dollars in credit money to bomb markets and, and manufacture consent in the media. This is what this is about. And there's only one way to do this. You have to destroy the offshore dollar market system. And that's why SOFR is so damned important. And once you get that, wrap your head around it, it's not like the, the Fed is a good guy here or the yeah. commercial banks well, in the United well, States are good guys. They're thing. not. That's They're just, they want control. They just want control. But they no, want a different type important. of control. That's an important point because I think a lot of people, because you know, a lot of people were so disillusioned during the pandemic, and they were like, "Oh, we 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 face this singular monolith, right?" And so right. They, a lot of people kind of view this as like, "Oh, it's too good to be true that someone could be fighting Davos." But it's like you need to you need to bear in mind. You need to they, remember that the, it's, it's just a temporary either. alliance. Yeah, the yeah. Fed is um, acting in uh, acting, and, and, and the commercial banks are acting leave? out of existential threat to their existence. And where does this leave? Um, so. Uh, one more question about this, and then I want to do a few quick fire questions, and then we'll sure. we'll wrap it cool. up. So, sure. so um, 
in term, where does this leave the American empire? Like the Wall Street, um, does it leave, like they, do they have any aspirations to maintain it? I mean, it's obviously no. been a big source of their power. No, I don't do you think, think I don't think so at all. I think they, they understand. It I think, it, I think the, the Fed understands that Powell's as much said this, there's room in the world for more than one reserve currency. Okay. That came out of the mouth of the FOMC chairman. Mm. A week after he was, he, was phys he was physically reconfirmed by the Senate. The reason, as you, to finish the answer to the question earlier that you asked about why is Powell still in charge, it's because, one, um, they couldn't stop, they, they, he couldn't, they couldn't get him out of power because um, they didn't have the votes in the Senate to put in Lael Brainerd. It was just never there. And moreover, they didn't have, you know, they didn't have the, the fiscal leverage to neuter the Fed. Okay, and force Powell again to monetize six and a half trillion or seven trillion dollars worth of unnecessary spending, which would have destroyed the United States. So the commercial banks here in the US understand, I think they understand that this is a mess that can only be dealt with through uh, a mixture of liquidation and yeah. inflation. And that's okay. where we are now. And we're going and and after years of the Europeans living high on the hog on our money, hate to say this, but you guys were all busted and broke after the last freaking European war. <laughs> we're going to take all that money that's there and we're going to suck it into the American capital system. We're going to rebuild and we're going to start the fiscal reform process, I think, with the 2024 election cycle, if, it, if everything works out perfectly. Yeah, I'm, not, admit I'm not forecasting that, but I think that we're going to see a massive dollar a uh, massive capital in wave into the united states especially after the midterm elections which everybody is in europe is scared to death about and once that happens okay um it's going to cause a tremendous dislocation within the united states economy because the strong the dollar will become too strong at some point and we're going to see the capital flow back out again but it won't flow back to europe because they burned all their bridges it'll flow to the chinese the russians and the iranians and everybody else but in the process you'll have a you'll have the beginnings of the restitution of the rule of law and fiscal responsibility in the United States. It will take us a generation or two to unwind all that. And in the yeah. process, you know, we may lose parts of the country, yada, yada, yeah. yada. But, the game you know, is, yeah, game I don't want to go that far into the future. Let's just get yeah. through the next two or three years. And, yeah, and the, the midterms. So what are you looking for? What, what should we 70 to 90 for? seats in the other Republicans in the House, three to five okay. seats in the Senate. Okay. And that would be a blowout. That, that would be a blowout of uh, such immense proportions. It would get Joe Biden impeached and convicted of treason for selling the Strategic Petroleum Reserve to Sinopec, which is, and, I think, is exactly what's going to happen. This is a pure and and this at this stage, this is a pure Republican Democrat play, like just more seats. Yeah, there's no third party. The no, there's no third. We're not party. thinking in terms of like a faction within the Republican Party or anything. No, no, it's, it's going to be how badly do the. Do it's going to be how many hit. how many GOP establishment types. Do they slip in under the, how many Dr. Oz's did they slip in as opposed to Magatards? If they get a whole bunch of Marjorie Taylor Greens and Lauren Boberts, um, everything changes. And they're working overtime right okay. now, both sides are, so to the, try so and character more of more Mitt Romney's than, than Lauren Boberts. That's what they're okay, trying. Okay, so the character of the people that are put in place also matters as well. Well, so matter. We need, we, need oh, to be looking, we need to be looking at that as well. Okay, mm -hmm. perfect. Well, um, yeah, that wraps, that wraps all that up very nicely. Um, I just have a couple of questions that I want to kind of, that I want to clarify. Sure. Um, we can do sort of quick, you know, relatively brief answers, but it's just something that questions that I've had when you know over the over the months of following your work about the sort of broad picture and the different players right so you know mm -hmm. you the main point that you make is you know you're very keen to distinguish between um davos and america because i assume because you know a lot of people just kind of blame america for everything and that yes it, it, and it doesn't really so you differentiate between davos and then europe so we, we've, and we've covered at this point, it's pretty clear that, you know, you can, you can sort of, um, you can break the US into the commercial banks and the Fed and the Davos types and the globalists and uh, the more Davos. Yes, that we have at least two different factions vying for control of the U of, of US policy. Yeah. Right um, now. And so turning to Europe and to, so where does the UK fit into this and how do we make oh, something like you Brexit. Um, so if you look at Brexit, right, that suggests there was life in the old dog yet. You, you know, you claim, you know, you speak. Depending that, you on how you, depending on your interpretation of it. Yeah. Brexit was meant to be life in the old dog. It was subverted yeah, yeah. by American interests to wrest control from Europe by putting in Boris Johnson and not putting in a real honest to God, somebody Brexit decent. Here. 
So, okay. yeah. So, and, and what, you know, people talk about the Anglo-American establishment. Um, I've got, you know, some, some of this stuff doesn't make sense. We can get to in, in a second, but so some elements of the city of London and mm. he didn't know none of them ever wanted Brexit. So they, they were one hundred percent out. So, so Brexit. So who no, they were the ones that are mostly spending the money to try and stop it. So Brexit, obviously, there's a, is a there's a populist element to it. But who? What is the faction that has engineered that from the UK's perspective and from the America? And I guess well, Brexit, the American role. Yeah. Oh, Brexit was a pure like like Trump was a pure populist uprising. So there wasn't. You don't think there was anyone too um, established? No, too, no, come on, no, 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 no. So it's like it's like it's it's. No, I'm sorry. It's very obvious the the British people the, wanted out of the European Union, and the, that's probably and the numbers are probably closer to sixty forty than fifty than the fifty two or fifty five forty five rather than the fifty two forty eight of the original vote. Yeah, because what's I, interesting and and quite um quite uh hum- humbling or humbling is the wrong word but it's quite sort of sobering is what i was looking for hmm. is that you know you had you had the telegraph you had the spectator they were pushing you had the sun pushing quite hard for you know pushing very hard for brexit they were out and out brexiteers and now yeah. they're just like utter davos simps yeah well they were because yeah. they always wanted they wanted yeah. brexit but they wanted brexit on their terms which was to put in people like boris johnson and liz truss and and establish uh, real establishments types that were, weren't going to really actually change anything like yeah. they gave us the we got rid of david you guys we got rid of david cameron we got theresa may okay. theresa may negotiated on the part of europe you negotiated Europe's terms on the part of the UK for, for three for three years. Johnson comes in, doesn't really do much to change things other than to kind of hold the line a little bit. I covered it in, in grave detail when it was happening because I always thought I always knew Brexit was a big story. And then you know, once but we always but everybody always said, and Nigel Farage said this that don't trust Boris Johnson because he's not a real Brexiteer. Well, that's true. Well, John, but you know, but I got news for you, Nigel. You need to stop being a royalist if you actually want to be a real Brexiteer. Because, you know, the crown is, you know, I, I, there is embedded in this stuff as, as everybody embedded. else is. Yeah. And so the, the goal of it, of Brexit, is, as conceived by the Tories, was to gain, and, and Farage in many ways, was to reestablish the old relationship between the United States and Britain. Mm. So and that's of, what AUKUS is all about as an extension yeah. of NATO. And that, they, and that the American, Anglo-American, uh, faction would gain would recontain would re uh, gain control over um policy from the europeans and reestablish that order yeah and the neoconservatives in both camps then saw the opportunity to go after and and the and, and saw the opportunity then to go after the russians and do and then start running that old script which davos doesn't want they want an even worse script We've got the Ameri- we got the Anglo-American neocons. They want a terrible script, and the people are all sitting there going, "We don't want any of this." So when when you speak of the the Anglo-American neocons, this is 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 this when people in you know people like um, Matthew Eret and pe- people like um, Alex Crane and quite mm-hmm. you know it's quite widely used. People just use the term the British, right? Yeah. Um, when people speak of the British, like who are they who are they talking about? We, we are talking about the old British deep state. The and, I'm, deep, and, I, and, and I'm and I'm fully on board with that as this that idea part, as well. And this is the part that was the part that interfaced with the American Empire, right? The part the old yeah, British they, Empire, they, the last they, remnants they, of it. Because, yeah, I mean, um, we have so many. We have so many British. We have so many. Um, uh, we have we have such Britain, the UK, and MI6, and and the British Foreign Office have such deeply and they are deeply embedded in so many of our structures here in the us and that's just that's just networks of of people who it's just networks of people and whatnot and because of that and so the so the uk is always trying to make the united states do what they want them to do which is for the for the british it's destroy the russians yeah it's been that that's been british that's been british foreign policy for 150 years yeah destroy the russians i think yeah it's just um you know makes sense in a lot of ways it's just i think there's some confusion because um you know people lo- it's been very popular recently to talk about tragedy and hope with mm-hmm. carol quigley and yes, about yeah, yes the cecil rhodes group and the rest of it but you know when you actually look into and they talk about milner and stuff and a lot of people have inferred from that that oh it's still the Mil- milner and cecil rhodes group that are that are in charge um but you know that makes empirically extremely little sense when you know you look at 
you know, you look at sort of like the kind of families that were involved in these in, in those sorts of societies, and there's been immense churn, right? These people now work for Google, right? Like, right. These, like the sort of um, the great grandsons of the guy who used to advise the, the you know the, the prime minister when Britain was at her height and the rest of it. Like these people literally are now like product managers at Google and Facebook. Yeah, I know, so I know, it's I've crazy. Always, so I've always um. So I've struggled. I've struggled with that based on you know based on what I see, and and also you know people like um, Milner. They were like autarchists, right? He was like an economic right. nationalist. So, it, so basically, the the extent to which the British have transferred their their influence, does it speak to more kind of financial elements and the MI six? Like how how does how is I, 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 at, that, how, at that point I don't I'm not enough of a historian to care. I'm going to be yeah. honest. With you. I mean, there comes a point like Matt Eric cares far more about the stuff than I do. Yeah, because that's yeah. that's his bailiwick. It's his gig. It's his bag. So it's what he it's what he gets up gets up in the morning and cares about. I don't. Yeah. I care about where we're going, not where we've been. I'm not a yeah. historian. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And where we're going is in. I'm looking at the game board, yeah. and I look at. I'm very much a game player and a and a, a, and an analyst from that perspective. And I'm always looking for. I'm looking. For, I'm. I'm always looking at it. I'm the guy whose turn it is, and I need a firing solution to win. How do yeah, I and, win? And so from that perspective, you view the UK as, at the moment, just like a Davos satellite. I see the UK as trying desperately to find its way back to relevance while it, dis- while it dis- systematically destroys what's left of itself. Okay. I see the UK no different than Poland. Yeah. And Poland is subservient to the UK. The Poles have a way out. They have a firing solution for them. Like I said, I, I think of this in terms of I've, I've got a handful of cars. It's my turn. What do I do? I got these four people around me. I, I got this board state. What do I do? How do I win from here? Can't win. Okay. How do I keep somebody else from winning? Okay. Mm-hmm. How do I do this? How do I, and this is the way I, this is the way I look at everything. So I look at the polls and I go, I know how the polls win. The polls win by telling the, the Brits to go, to go scratch, to tell the EU to go scratch and, and open up and have coffee between four ministers with the Russians. Yeah. That's what they do. And then they sign a gas and they sign a gas supply contract and they're done. Yeah. How do the Brits get out of this? Well, they don't, so but I can what, see them at the table going, how do I, how do I, I can see them. The, the, the Brits are like the classic uh, board game player who suffers from analysis paralysis going, I want to win, but I can't win. I've got these resources. These resources aren't enough. So I'm going to sit here and I'm going to filibuster for 20 minutes agonizing over what move to make and because i refuse to accept the fact that i've lost yeah that we do need to and that's uh, where we are we do and I, I have friends like this like they do this every night when i'm i, I do this every wednesday night actually when yeah. i go to my board i'm like stop it just make a move you lost I, i've beaten you just get over yeah, yourself yeah. and the so, brits won't accept this and so they keep trying to get they 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 Brexit was uh, putting Johnson in power was a means by which to get control again. And then, you know, and they subverted Brexit that way, as opposed to doing what was right by the British people, which was saying, you know what, we're out of the European Union. We don't need anything else. We're going to become an independent, proper nation, and we're not going to sign up for any more of this foreign entanglement nonsense. And this is where I get angry about Nigel Farage. Farage well, he's, he's never stopped, way, never stopped with the anti-Iranian, anti-Russian, you know, pro-Israeli well. bullshit. Like, like it's he, so stupid. No, he's um, yeah, actually, yeah. So yeah, Farage. I love Nigel, but like, dude, yeah, that's he, his that, that, that's his yeah, failure as a human. No, he he came out and said um, not that long ago after we got the supposed Brexit victory. Not not I'm saying after the deal came through. Right. He said, I'm turning to my next enemy now, China. Right, um, like it's so, like, yeah, dude, so like that's a big issue. wrong, and yeah, like he's, so, so he's a classic freaking neocon and so on yeah, foreign fi- policy. So on that final question about this, um, and then you can tell everyone where to where to find your your really sure. good work. Um, so yeah, I heard I heard you speaking to Alex Craner, and you you described the British as MI6, and then ne- the neocons who have taken over the U.S. State Department. Uh, sounded it for years. Yeah, so, so sounds a lot to me like Zionists. Like the Zionist faction, like do you? Yeah, like, we can go there if you like. I'm not. A, I'm, I'm not a big fan of. Like, it's very obvious that there's that there are that Israel's influence in the world and its importance in the world doesn't come from the United States. It comes from the British. Yeah, and it the and, British created and, and Israel. Yeah, and so and its influence in America 
it's sort of part of it's through that conduit right via the yes uh, the, via brits, the brits have controlled our media for so long they've destroyed they've destroyed they've controlled our foreign policy they've they've influenced so much of this stuff and yeah. i hate to tell everybody this but british commies are the worst commies okay british crypto jews are the worst of the problem yeah. I, and they're all embedded within the elites yeah. they're there go they've all anglified their names but they're all there it's yeah. this is and they and then they created out a whole cloth stuff like the judeo-christian tradition in order yeah. to get yeah. in yeah. order to get the heartland of america on board with fighting uh a fight, becoming the, the global cop to, to for israel it's nonsense like there's nothing more contradictory than yeah. the judeo-christian tradition christianity is a reactionism against judaism yeah it's um, not they're not the same religions and the same thing with this idea that we're all we have western values it's another british mi6 creation yeah western values is nonsense we're not european yeah we left europe to become americans like we we created america to get away from europe <laughs> we, we are the people who hate we are the europeans who hate europe that's why we came here we respect our homelands but we don't want to be european anymore we're americans i'm an italian american no american tells says to you well yeah i'm, I'm german no you're not they say i'm german american yeah i um, you know and and I, I i need to remind everybody that, and we've been trying very hard since like when they all like all the waves of immigration in the united states which built the united states into this current form they've been, we've been trying very hard to change those definitions subtly to get everybody to start talking about their nationality being more important than their americanism yeah um, and i want i want that to end american values are different than european values very different okay um yeah no i'm glad that that does talk that was my suspicion is that mm -hmm. that's the how to square because that was one piece that I, and also it's just convenient not to talk about these things because of you know for because of youtube reasons. and all the all because obvious like, who the hell, reasons who the hell wants to invite all that when we have bigger we have bigger uh, issues to talk about than that the but, uh, important thing is that look I, I i tell this to people all the time during my live streams and everything else i'm like, they're like come on tom just name the blah and i'm like why so make you feel good yeah like so i can lose my platform what's the point yeah. I'm, t I'm sitting here trying to give you distinctly unique information and insight into the world and you want to hash out what happened 40 years ago and because you've got an axe to grind because you need your because you need your your thing validated like do the math like i infer stuff all the time you do the same thing going like, yeah, i don't really want to talk about that well you're yeah. a cook okay fine i'm a cuck call me what you want i don't give a shit yeah, yeah, like, yeah. I have yeah. bigger fish to fry here, which is I'm trying to take out the most evil people in the world. Yeah. Um, no, I, I'm glad. Yeah. I mean, it's, um, you, you know, sometimes you can infer it, but you just need to, you know, I just wanted to, I had, a, <laughs> basically I had that suspicion and I'm still piecing it together and I'm kind of glad to have, um, it, I, I, I'm, I, don't have, I, I spent an thoughts. hour the other night talking with my friend Halsey English about Israel and about yeah. Israel's plight in this situation. Yeah. I have a lot of empathy. For the situation i don't want to see i mean I, I don't care one way or the other about any of this stuff mm -hmm. i you know i i don't want the people of any of these countries to be wiped out yeah okay but at the same time everyone has to take responsibility for what they've done we have a responsibility as americans to take to depower the american empire the Brit you british are ready for a new oliver cromwell and it's not nigel farage to step up sweep yeah. oh, we need yeah, we, power we, and start the process over again we need uh, a complete like spiritual revival here yeah, absolutely think you guys may perhaps have a second wind right like not it wasn't that long ago you got long ago you guys thought you guys were sort of unassailable you were and now right. you're kind of like oh shit, you having your first experience yeah. of not being a hegemon so i think it's like let's get ourselves together now again and go again but we we, we have the, we have the possibility of that happening you ha it's, the yeah, russians yeah. have gone through the russians have gone through their long dark, yeah. long dark tea time of the soul um, Unfortunately, and we have a longer road back. We we kind of have had a couple of cracks at the whip, and we've been yeah we've been trying to retain it. So yeah, we need. Well, um, and, and until the end, until the central bank, the era of the central bank dominated economy ends, which started with the formation of the Bank of England back in 1694. Yeah. Until that, until that is finally, until you finally internalize that that the empire is over, yeah, and that you're not important. I, I got news for you. 
The UK is not an important economy anymore. It's yeah. only important because of the city of London. And the longer the city of London holds its nose and tries to act like the Russians are more evil than they are, they're going to lose the bulk of their business. And that business is shipping insurance yeah. and financial and, and financial. And, and, and those systems are so very important. The Russians are going to build a shipping in, um, insurance business. They're going to eat Lloyd's of London on this. And when that's done, you guys have nothing left other yeah. than sheep. And, yeah. you know, people with well, that. Other than, so, other than um, you know, I have a lot of faith in, in our spirit and our. our oh, I so do I. I mean, I, I, make, I, make, needs, um, I make. I don't mean to, to, to be dismissive. Oh, no, no. Oh, no, no you, I, I think you're, what you're saying is 100% right. I'm saying that I, I still have. I have optimism, but it's, it's, it's going to need to get bad, basically. It's, yeah, it's going to need to get worse really, before. Really but bad. we have the same problem here in the US. Yeah. Like, um, too many people here are still a little, a little fat. Yeah. And still think that it's like we can get out of this without too much pain. I'm like, oh no, baby! Like yeah. you, you have told the you have told the most powerful people in the world to go scratch. You don't think that they're not going to? They're they're not you're like I live in Florida. Like I know what's coming next. Ready? Yeah. What's coming next for me is when there's a big hurricane that wipes out a city in Florida. It will not get rebuilt. There will be no federal response from the Biden administration to Florida when it happens. They will, mm. and then they will, and then the British media, just con, you know, controlled by you know, in, in Europe, will then talk about how dysfunctional the United States is because they can't rebuild Miami. People respect the British accent too much. That's the thing. That's why the BBC is still relevant. It's like ice. I like it. I, that's you're, you're why right. that, we're. Li- it's amazing how these things work. But like that part of the only reason we're still relevant is because of the quite outdated. Um, sort of views and reverence people hold for for the british polish and the british accent and having a nice yeah. posh lady explain why davos's interests are really great and and the rest of it i so. know it's it's, it's amazing like, because everybody still wants to believe that they're part of the cool kids club yeah. when the tr- but that's that's thing. also what's holding us back right because like, i agree we have egos and we're like the bbc is literally destroying our interests but we're like oh but the bbc kind of makes us relevant again so it's that's kind of like stopping a lot of people from fully just waking up and and um, yeah no I think it's I, I think you're I think you're absolutely right I mean I I was sucked into it for a long time too and I think it's you know but don't get me wrong like I I the I, I got to give the BBC credit for a couple of things like you know like many seasons many good seasons of Doctor Who <laughs> yeah. um, Top Gear Saturday like Chef, some, Saturday Kitchen um, um like the the the, uh, the 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 British Pottery Challenge I I like that one yeah. I mean there's a lot of things I mean don't get me wrong like but then there's the rest of it like yeah you know, it's like and I, I just don't want to take. I just don't want to take the. You know, I, yeah. I, I'm, I'm ready to not take the good with the bad. But God, what they, what, what y'all have done to our media here in the yeah. U.S. Oh, like they've, they've tabloidized our entire media to the point of irrelevance, and um, yeah. it, it, it's a cancer, and it's got to, it's got to end. We, you know, but the only way we're going to get out of this is with a good old fashioned like crack up boom and bankruptcy. And um, I think yeah. that there are very smart people who understand that as well, and that. Um, we can there's a path out of this and it's not a path that's going to be easy or fun it's going to be hard it's going to be ugly i apologize to my daughter all the time about the world i'm leaving her but you know it is like everything else this is this is the life we have so you yeah. do your best with what you've got and you understand that if this is the if this is the 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 sandwich we all have to take a bite out of the shit sandwich we all have to take a bite out of well you know slap on some oh, like, like, like get it over and done with and let's move on yeah, as a and as opposed to the grousing over the spoiled milk that's on the ground, like you can't yeah. do it. Well, move this up. rolls us into old goats and guns, right? And where people can find sure. more of your work. Uh, so you can find me my my work over at my blog at tomluongo.me. From there, you can get the link to the Patreon if you want to become a member. Um, where a lot of what I do is actually behind the paywall. There, you can sign up for the newsletter, or you can just sign up for uh, the the private blog post and the private uh, podcast that I do. There's also a public podcast I just um, put out, episode 113 this morning with Alex Craner. Um, and uh, you know, all, that's there. And I'm on Twitter at tfl1728 where I'm regularly one of the most obnoxious, I think one of the most obnoxious people on Twitter outside of Paul Krugman. But, you know, what am I, what am I going to tell you? It's fun. Um, yeah. You know, fight me, bro. It's fun. I, I think Twitter is just a blast sometimes. Um, so that's my gig. But my, my goal here is I don't want to be right about everything. I, I mean, I, 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 I come, don't come by by any of my opinions lightly, but I yeah. can be taken off of them 
yeah. by a well-structured argument. Yeah. And um, I'm searching for the truth just like everybody else is in a world of bad information, yeah. mal, mis, and disinformation. Yeah, and that's, the best um, we can do is uh, you know put together the scenarios that we can, test those theories and those hypotheses in public, put your you know put your yeah. best spin on it, and then if you're wrong, you're wrong, and then go you know look, I'm sorry, but you know you can't. None of this stuff is is a none of this stuff is prediction. Yeah. Okay. All well, of it is probability um, assessment. But yeah, that's why you know that's why I was keen to get you on because um, you know it, ultimately you know time will tell, but you know you provide you open people's thinking up, right? There's been a lot of very narrow minded, um, yes. kind of very dogmatic, even, you know, dissident, it's amazing how quickly kind of dissident movement gets re- dissident movements get really dogmatic as well. And yeah. So, oh no, it's, it is. So that's I mean, why I thought yours is, um, a voice that I really want and arguments I really wanted to get out there because a, they make a lot of sense and B, they provide, they free people up they, to question well, certain assumptions. And I think that's often the, the triumph, right? Yeah, it like, is. Because it gets, because all- assumptions to, entertain other possibilities into yeah what's, what's funny about all this is that i was a hell of a lot more dogmatic when i was younger just like you know when i was early to the libertarian movement and idea i was i went i went through all of this i've, I've gone through every state of uh, of consciousness that a dis that the like a dissident right nominally right wing guy can go through and i want and what's frustrating is watching people within that space never getting out of where they they uh, yeah. end up in a space and then they never leave it and i'm like really like yeah. okay am i just an anomaly because I, I i watch people like peter schiff or brandon smith over at alt market or you know to, i mean i can name the, like, like all the way around the board and i, I watch these people on like, all the silver and gold bug guys all of those and alice and mcclaw i think they're all operating within the same framework that they yeah. figured out the world and now all they're doing is applying the same filter over and over again. Yeah, and, and they wait for people right. to come to them to, to receive the truth, right? Yeah, and, the, and, and right. they just refuse to, and they just refuse to go, what if I'm wrong? Yeah. Um, and, and I, 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 I watched I it. Agree. It's called left brain possession. I've watched it happen and I'm not interested in it anymore. I've, I've see it in myself and I have, I'll be honest with you. I have a great community of people. Who are part of my patrons who do the same, who help to reinforce this, to challenge me on a regular basis, and I've got a, and I've got an amazing wife who is intellectually so freaking curious that she's constantly putting new things into my head, yeah. philosophically speaking, and that are even orthogonal to all of this. And I'm like, Ooh, I can use that. That's interesting, you know. She and and it's a and and I have a great partner in in the newsletter as well, and he's also one of these people who's just tremendously gifted in terms of being able to mm. remain flexible, see things from other people's point of view. And then all the training, like I said, I, I've spent years and years playing games where I'm like, I'm so competitive. It's not funny to go, how do I win this? Can I win this? Do I have an opportunity to win? No. How do I keep that guy from winning? I will not give this game. And then when you, when you get into that mindset, you can start to see how other people react yeah. on the world stage because it just winds up being the exact same thing because human behavior is it's human behavior it's nothing yeah. new so. and it just requires a bit of a checking of the ego to be able to get yeah, your head absolutely. out of your ass and appreciate and actually empathize with people that you might think are degenerates you know oh i have to and I, i'll yeah. and i'll tell you that the worst part about this job right and to <laughs> me it, it's both a job and a calling is having yeah. to spend my days deep in the heads of some of the most disgusting people on the planet yeah and it's um, very tiresome and it's very tiring but you yeah. know yeah yeah well, well i'll let you i'll let you get to uh to rest absolutely. after venting your spleen <laughs> absolutely thank you sir um, i appreciate it and this was, um, this, this was fantastic I, I had a you know awesome time and like I, I had a few kind of things that i really wanted to cover with you and i'm we did that we did that very good. nicely so this was awesome and i yeah i really encourage everyone to to kind of follow the long the links that tom has provided yep um, and uh, some, just send me a send me a link when this moment. when this thing goes live and i'll and i'll and you know, I'll I make sure do. that my people see it. All right. I will. Do. Cheers, Tom. Thank you, Seb. Have a good day now. Bye bye. Right, bye bye. Thank you for listening to that. If you enjoyed the way that I think about these issues, then you might enjoy Pith Weekly. So, Pith Weekly is my blog, which I email out every Saturday morning, uh, somewhere where I share my latest thinking on metapolitics. And I also share some highlights of what I've read. I'm always digging through some really critical texts uh, in the area. Um, and it's it's something which is um, the center point for what I'm doing. Uh, you know, the reality is we don't really know what's going to happen, and 
what platforms people are going to be kicked off of over the next few months, whether YouTube, Twitter, whether Gab's going to take off, but that will always be there. My email will always be there. I will always be sending my, my best thoughts out and my best learnings out every Saturday morning. So I really hope some of you subscribe. You can find the link in the description. Um, and it'd be great to, to have you as part of my community, as a node in my network. Um, so thanks again.